Honourable members, the eyes are 106, the nose are 12. Part 3, as amended, will stand part. Now, honourable members, we need to focus our minds on part 4. And uh, the debate on part 4 are clauses 133 through to 149A, clause 16, and clauses 150 to 157. Mr Chair. I call the honourable member Moana Mackey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Now, these are very, part four is very important because it contains the transitional provisions um, for the legislation, which is how we deal with those activities that are currently underway, uh, which now need to be brought into this scheme, uh, those existing activities, those who have been granted uh, consents under the Crown Minerals Act, uh, but have not yet started that activity, and also deals with um, uh, future transitional provisions for changes in regulations that might occur um, under future governments, which under the next Labor government, obviously, there will be changes. Um, I, I just want to start by saying these are significant changes to what we saw at Select Committee, significant. And it's actually very, very difficult to fully understand uh, the impact of these changes when we're not able to sit down with officials and talk through uh, what the various changes mean. Um, it is, again, very disappointing that this wasn't dealt with at Select Committee. The advantage of delaying this bill by just a couple of weeks, bearing in mind that there was quite, quite a, a generous period between it leaving the Select Committee and it coming back to the House for its second reading, um, would have been that, that the regulations would have been available so that we could have um, taken a more holistic view of the bill, the legislation alongside the regulations and dealt with these transitional provisions if there were significant problems with them, uh, which there must have been because we're making uh, quite drastic changes and quite, and quite large changes to what the Select Committee finally decided upon. Um, and it's in the reading of these changes, it appears that, that in, in, in tightening up the purpose clause, and, and I reiterate that we don't think that goes far enough in meeting our international obligations, but in tightening up that purpose clause, it appears that there's been a lot of loosening up in other areas to avoid a backlash from industry, uh, would be my reading of what's happened in transitional provisions here. And it, when I say it's really difficult to, to fully comprehend whether some of these changes are minor or significant, um, it, it's changes like, for example, um, uh, clause 149A is, is um, and when we look at, at part four of that, it says, uh, it used to say in the existing bill back from select committee that, that, that it had to comply with section 40. Now, when you look at section 40, section 40 um, describes what an impact assessment must contain. So it goes through everything about, about what it has to do, what it has to contain, it goes into great detail. Well, that's just been removed from the legislation completely and replaced with something else about incomplete applications. Um, and I'm not sure why Section 40 was removed, given that these are, these are people who don't have to go through the full process, but instead have to provide an impact assessment. And we're now saying that the clause that describes what has to be in an impact assessment no longer applies. Now, that may be something that, that's minor. It doesn't seem like something that's minor. It seems like something fairly significant. And the same when you look at, at, sub, at, at um, number seven, where uh, subsection five, um, which is uh, listed above, overrides section 15. Now, when you go back and look at what section 15 is, section 15 is actually one of the, one of the most important parts of the bill. It's, it's in part 1A, which is the duties and restrictions, and it's the restrictions on activities in the exclusive economic zone and in or on the continental shelf. And it goes through in some detail um, about what mustn't happen in the exclusive economic zone, um, about the environmental damage that could occur. It's a very important section. Now, that, that part 7 of this new, of this new um, part, uh, new clause, I mean, that might just be something that's technical. It might be that these are transitional provisions and so that part no longer applies. But this wasn't raised with us at Select Committee. And it's whenever I see something overriding a significant part of the legislation, I would like to know why. And the other disturbing thing is that the Minister's um, explanatory note is completely silent on this. It doesn't explain why um, this is happening. So I would like... Um, a member in the chair, uh, Minister in the Chair was actually a member of the Select Committee for some of this. So I would appreciate a call on this because... Former minister, yeah, could, well, the former minister could take a call um, and explain um, if he knows the answer to that, because these do, these are uh, wholesale changes to what we decided at select committee, and we're over. Right, we're now no longer, no longer 
saying that when you're providing an impact assessment, you have to have reference to the clause that says what has to be in that impact assessment, and we're overriding um, a, a very serious clause about duties and responsibilities and what cannot happen under the exclusive economic zone. And I think it's only fair to ask what the, what the practical impact of that is going to be, why we're doing it, why um, this wasn't raised as an issue at Select Committee. Um, and then I come on to... So we, we have the clauses for existing existing activities, and, and again, as I said, these changes have been made, we'd like to know the answers to that. But now we have a whole new set of transitional provisions for planned activities, Mr Chair. Oh, I'm Mackie. Thank you. For planned activities. And when we were going through, in select committee, when we were going through the clauses around existing activities, and these are things that are already happening out there, so that's fine, you know, you've got to transition them in, you can't just say, well, on the day this legislation passes, you have to stop doing what you're doing until you get a marine consent. Yeah. Absolutely understand that. We had concerns around, around how far that might extend and where people hadn't really already started or that people might rush to hurry up and get in. And we were assured that, no, this was just existing activities. This is where people are already doing it and it would be unreasonable to expect them to stop just because we passed a law, given that everything was consented and everything was approved um, under, under the previous kind of legislative situation. And then the Minister's SOP comes out and suddenly we're talking about planned activities, not just existing activities. And the definition of plan activities um, says it means an activity involving, involved with the exploration, prospecting or mining for petroleum, and, and the same occurs for minerals, uh, bef A, before the act comes into force, the exploration, prospecting or mining for petroleum with which the activity is involved is authorised by a permit that was granted under the Crown Minerals Act, and B, the activity had not commenced before the act comes into force. We're no longer dealing with existing activities. We're now dealing with things, and, and it's a question I asked of the Minister um, in part 1A, and she said she'd come back to it in part 4 because she felt that's where the discussion on transitional provisions should occur. What I want to know is, is, is if we take the example, because when we're doing about transitional activities, the problem is we are actually talking about specific cases that the public know about now and are concerned about now. It's not kind of in the theoretical, in the future, we might be doing some stuff out here. It's actually there, there, are, there are cases uh, and there are permits that have been granted right now that are sitting there and off the East Coast, the Petrobras uh, permit which has been granted is a, is a well-known example. Now, Petrobras have only carried out seismic surveying so far. Um, they've said they want to drill some exploratory wells. Uh, we're talking 3,000 to 4,000 metres deep. That obviously raises significant concerns in the community that I live in um, about the feasibility of doing that. What happens if something goes wrong? We notice that Anadarko um, in, in far less deep waters has recently pulled back because of the inability to get a rig. Um, these, the rigs for the deep water are, are not that common, they're not like the, the smaller rigs, but it does beg the question, if it's so hard to get a rig to do the, the initial drilling, how easy is it going to be to get a second rig to drill a relief well, which is what you're going to need in waters of that depth because you can't cap at 3,000 to 4,000 metres deep. So my question is, does this mean that if Petrobras want to go ahead and drill that well, they no longer have to get a marine consent because it was a planned activity? Because it was a planned activity. Does it mean that they can now go ahead with the exploration and mining because it was a planned activity and they have already been granted the permit. Now, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm hoping the answer to that question is no, that if they, as soon as they decide they want to start drilling, they are going to have to go through the marine consent uh, process because that activity has not started yet. Um, and in fact, it's a long way off, I suspect, particularly given some of the reported financial problems the company's having. But my reading of this is that even if it wasn't what it was intended, it could very easily be interpreted, and again, we don't want more legal battles over this to define it, as saying that because they've been granted a, per a permit under the Crown Minerals Act, that makes it a planned activity, which means that they could go ahead and continue not just the seismic surveying, which is fine, um, but also exploratory drilling and potentially mining in the Rokumra Basin, 3,000 to 4,000 metres deep, without my community getting to have a say, without going through the full marine consent process. Uh, and if that's the case, then that is deeply, deeply Worrying, especially as the government is, is issuing a large number of these permits right now. Now, suddenly, that issuing of the permit process that's going on now uh, carries a much greater significance if, by getting one of those um, before this legislation passes into law, uh, that suddenly gives you rights out into perpetuity to be able to, to go through exploration, um, exploratory drilling, and mining without going through any. Um, process which examines the environmental impact um, of 
those activities? So I sincerely hope that the answer is no, they can't, in which case the question would be why are we even having to recognise planned activities if it hasn't gone ahead? Why is the existing activities provisions, why are the existing activity provisions not strong enough um, to deal with that? Or, or if there is some little, little difficulty that needs to be fixed, then, then why are we not just patching up or strengthening, beefing up the existing activities provisions instead of creating this whole new class? And I, you know, I hate to be cynical, but I really feel that this was the trade-off with industry, that when they saw that the, the word balance going, which was something they really wanted in the purpose clause, they said, well, what are we going to get in return? And I suspect that this is what they got in return. And I, I would like someone to take a call and, and, and I call Eugenie Sage.